Welcome. I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, this is our first lecture this year, and I'm delighted that uh, we have Dan Rockhill here. I'm, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my uh, my first knowledge of uh, of Dan's work. Um, it's it's been a few years now, but I remember when I first saw the work of the 804 Studio, and I looked at it and. I, Wow, this is really great work. Where is it? And I found it was in Kansas, and it was done by students. Uh, man, that's fantastic. And then when I came to Texas Tech, um, and that's 11 years ago, uh, I I got a uh, an 804 a, a little booklet that documented one of the projects from the 804 Studio um, from uh, the University of Kansas. And then a little later, uh, I had a chance to, we, uh, the big 12 deans get together every once in a while to talk, commiserate, tell stories, you know, that kind of thing, therapy. And so I, um, I talked to, um, uh, to John Gaunt, and, and when we, we went up there, uh, we had a chance to, uh, to visit a couple of Dan's projects there. And one of them was a restaurant that's uh, really an absolutely beautiful restaurant. But as I began to learn more and more about, uh, about Dan's work, and then as I got to see it up close, um, what I, I just fell in love with its materiality. I fell in love with its haptic presence because fundamentally, I believe, that's exactly what architecture is about. And so uh, when we had a chance to uh, have a, a, a kind of an intersection here of a variety of things, we have our guests from El Paso. And by the way, um, some, uh, are any of the guests here? Any, raise your hands. All right, good. Thank you very much for coming. Well, the, uh, for the rest of you, uh, these are Texas Tech students who are in El Paso, and they are here for the weekend. They're here to see the school, to see the work, to, uh, to hear uh, Dan's talk and also to, um, uh, to go to the football game tomorrow. So, yay, uh, go Tech. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, back, to, uh, back to the 804 studio. This is an amazing enterprise. It's done by students, designed by students, built by students, erected by students, all within one semester. So. Um, I, I think you're going to really in, enjoy that from your point of view, but also it's, an, it's, a, it's a statement about how architecture locates us in the world by being utterly and completely tangible. The architecture's tangibility is one of its great gifts. It's, it's what makes us feel anchored in the world, and in a world that is becoming ever so more digital. Uh, we need more of that kind of architecture. We need more of the 804 architecture. We need more of architecture like the architecture that, that Dan produces. The other opportunity, that I, I never heard him speak until uh, this past, uh, uh, past, not this past summer, but the summer before, um, when Brian McKay Lyons, who was here last year, uh, held the uh, Ghost 13. And then I had a chance, Brian, I mean, uh, Dan was uh, one of the principal speakers at, at that symposium, which took place over three days in Halifax. There was a retrospective on the Ghost projects, but it was also a coming together about fundamental principles in architecture, having to do with craft and community and context. And so I, I I, abs I, was, I was enthralled by his, by his presentation, by the work that he showed, by the story that he has to tell, and what that means for architecture today. And I, and I asked him if somehow we could work out uh, getting him here. The, the other thing is that, um, as, as you know, Upe Flukicker has been working with design-build projects um, or as long as I've been here, of one, one scale or another. And, and um, Upe went up and visited Dan uh, at, his, at his studio 
Um, and so that's a very nice collab uh, collaboration or a connection there. And I'm, I'm excited about, uh, about what will, will come out of that as, as we move forward in the college. We have some resources, financial resources, that have come to us recently. And part of those, uh, I mean, actually all of those resources are going to go to give us another, uh, to build for us another 1,500 square feet onto our shop in some magical way in order to help push forward the, um, the, the agenda of architecture as built work in the world. So uh, with that, I'm really, really excited to have Dan Rockhill here. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to go pretty quickly because in my experience, five o'clock on a Friday afternoon is sort of happy hour. So I know you're kind of pushing that towards six and I appreciate it. But I'm gonna move through this work very quickly for you and I, I really encourage a Q&A session. Uh, so go ahead and be a, take notes or you know, get, get yourselves ready. Uh, as was pointed out in the introduction, I really wear two hats. One is what I do with Rock Hill and Associates and the other is what I do with Studio 804. I'm the only one that runs between the two. Um, and so just as a quick uh, introduction, I thought I'd give you a few things that are Rock Hill and Associates and then when I change hats you'll know and I go into Studio 804. So this is a wedding pavilion that we did um, on a field of brome grass out in the country. Um, the bride and groom will stand on a limestone slab that we elevated in the space. It's made out of hackberry and cottonwood trees that we felled along the river. Uh, the idea was that the bride would leave her ancestral home and come on access with the barnyard um, on a walkway that was temporarily laid out on top of the brome grass, go under this great lamella arch, which you'll see soon, and all the way to the end where the ceremony would take place on an early October uh, evening. So this is the structure there. And here it is when it's illuminated as all the chairs are brought back up under and the, sort of the reception takes place here. The whole concept for this, in a way, is, is how we look at life and certainly marriage. And it's a sort of juxtaposition between the, the sort of very informal, rather primal aspect of the, the wedding chapel, if you will, and the highly ordered and organized um, reception hall. And it's how we negotiate between those two, you know, sort of what our instinct tells us what we want to do versus what is expected of us and how we navigate through life. And so there was a fairly simple connection that we could make for them. As the father of the bride, that's me, when my son-in-law asked to marry my daughter, I said, yeah, it'd be great. We got a little work to do first. <laughs> Uh, here, here we are building what my daughter refers to as her cathedral. Uh, so, uh, so here's the lamella before we uh, set the, the roof, we put a canvas roof over it and skin the sides, etc. But it's all temporary and uh, you know, we did this for you know, very little money as you might imagine. And uh, it's, I still have the roof uh, stored up on the back of a truck in the barn. We dice the slab up. It's only an inch and a half thick. We pour it right over the brome grass and then dice that up into big tiles. And we've been finding 1,001 uses for 3,000 square foot of concrete uh, since then. So most of the work that I do, though, um, in, at, at this time as Rock Hill Associates was by and large driven by just the kind of residential language that uh, we wanted to explore. So this is a house out in the country, as you might be able to tell, called the Kansas Longhouse. Big, t uh, long building, 150 foot long, uh, barely penetrating the north exposure, which is what you see here. Um, but broad south exposure, maximizing all of the passive solar attributes. And you'll see that's actually a thread that runs through the bulk of the work that we do. Sort of energy driven, cheap solutions, mostly passive solar. So here on the north side, a very tight aperture there, skinned in limestone, uh, early um, uh, sod roof on that as well. 
and then the interior uh, exposed concrete floors, no interior walls uh, engage the outside walls in any way uh, directly for privacy. And so what we try to do is this is where you would sort of do your makeup or shave, whatever. Uh, that's the kind of the bathroom um, lavatory, but back behind that and closed in would be the water closet. So. Uh, another house all about energy here. This is all about recyclable materials. This is all made of uh, steel. And then here, again, taking advantage of uh, broad south exposure. Uh, another house called a terrace house. This is uh, for a couple who were interested in uh, the sort of Native American culture that came on our landscape before they did. And they were interested in our expressing something that captured that. So this kind of great room is sort of driven by uh, the Native American lodge houses and their, and their large um, congregation rooms in the Hogan. Uh, this is also another example of that. This is uh, uh, the Newton House, broad south exposure, Brissolet to help control overheating and the sunlight. And all of the buildings there are tethered in some way to a language that we pick up in the landscape. So in the previous house, the choice of the color and the way that works is derived from a lot of these buildings that are attached to just about every barn in, in our eastern part of the state. We're a beef cattle industry, but during the Depression, people couldn't afford to buy beef, but they had to have milk. And so all of the farmers converted to milk uh, in an effort to just make ends meet. So there are these beautiful little structural clay tile buildings that sort of dot the landscape, and they're really quite attractive. And so you kind of pick up on some of that language a little bit. This actually happens to be my barn uh, where I live. So when we get a client who says, you know, I've been suffering from mold from a really, you know, I, it's, I sneeze a lot. I think it's some, something in the basement, you know, and we're talking to her and, and she has a site out in the country and I say, well, you know, how about we elevate that form so that the, the building doesn't ever sit uh, directly on the ground. Not unlike what hay farmers are doing here, right? They, put, they take a marginalized piece of property. You can't quite get a tractor through here easily. Put some posts in and store hay in it, you know, that kind of thing. And so here is the platform house Again, you can probably tell from the south, the glass here, this is the south face. A little hard to tell from the angle there, but there is a cover that shades that glass. Broad south exposure, elevated form, you know, just kind of locking it in directly with the client's interest. So, so this is Kansas. Uh, this little introduction works better when I'm in Finland than in Texas. Um, but broad, you know, expanse, and you, uh, you got me on this one for sure. You got the broad uh, landscape, uh, muscular buildings. You got some of those too. Wheat, Bibles, <laughs> and these beautiful ad hoc assemblies. I, I love to drive around in the region, out in the, in the county, looking at buildings. Every place I go, we try to take the back roads. Uh, I just love the way these things are done. You know, very unselfconscious, obviously uh, not by an architect, but in the end, the assembly is absolutely seductive. Trains are out by us, a lot of this kind of stuff. Rednecks, got plenty of them. And <laughs> Tin Men, and we got you on that one, so. Crop dusters and us. You might be able to tell from the process already that I've talked about that we uh, do a lot of building. In fact, at this time, uh, there wasn't anything that we designed that we didn't build or anything that we built that we hadn't designed. And so we did that for many, many, many years. And I can share some of that with you. I live on a farm. And so that gives us an opportunity to explore a lot of materiality, ex, you know, work. And so here we're casting stone for, or concrete, uh, for a, a bathroom surround at some point of a big shop. And we're able to fabricate just about anything in steel. Um, and here we're making these football trusses that we call them for a project that I shared with you. You didn't see the roof line on it. but. Uh, make, you know, use a lot of recycled materials. This is a stainless steel funnel that we kind of dig out of the scrap yard. And we convert it into a laboratory. Um, make our own doors and windows. I don't need a steady diet of these things. We've done it two or three times. 
Uh, and so there isn't much we can do, can't do. Uh, we've also restored most of the Kansas historic sites. You know, we have skills in a lot of areas. And so when Kansas came into its history and we needed to start restoring some of these great buildings, uh, events that took place here led to the term bleeding Kansas, for any of you familiar with the history of and events that ultimately, ultimately led to the Civil War. Uh, and so we jacked this building up, hold it up in the air, and put a whole new foundation under it, and that set the building back down. We quarried stone out in Hayes, Kansas, to rebuild the blockhouse at Fort Hayes, going back to the original quarry where the soldiers had uh, uh, quarried the stone in 1869 uh, for that building. Most of the work now is um, outside of the immediate area. We still do a lot of that kind of work, and in fact, today we're doing work, uh, restoration work. But when you get a call from a developer who says, God, the work you do is just great, you know, but you couldn't do, you know, so and so because he knows we're tied to the building, I'm quick to say, no, 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 no. It's, it's the design that drives what I do. I love design. That to me is what it's all about. It so happens we can do the building and we're quite good at it, but it, my heart is in design. This is actually in Clovis, New Mexico, and I drove over there yesterday to see it. This is a, a former uh, hotel now converted or in the process of being converted to housing. And this is, an, there will be eventually another 30 units uh, of detached uh, from the hotel that will ultimately lead to 60 units in downtown Clovis, all in an attempt to breathe life back into that poor little town, which is a, a, a cancer that has spread across the country, right? These little towns are just dying. And so we saw an opportunity there and had a developer that was really interested in using our language and despite it being low income housing, we still feel pretty good about the results. So, so that's Rock Hill and Associates. Studio 804 is what I do with students, obviously, from the introduction you can tell and the teaching. And uh, I do this for a lot of reasons, and you'll see some examples of it, but what I'm gonna show you for the majority of the Studio 804 work is indeed what Andrew uh, shared with you, and that is we do it in one semester. And my students give up winter break. They start usually on the 3rd of January with me, and we have a finished building by the third weekend of May. Uh, which is pretty intense. Uh, we don't have the project laid out beforehand, or it would be rare if we did. Uh, so we have to identify the project, find the funding, do the design, go through the permitting, and do the build and be done for graduation. So it's pretty intense, as you might imagine. So I started doing a few other things, and I might be getting ahead of myself. And we do everything, incidentally. We don't sub anything. Uh, so, and, and that'll change a little bit later on as we get into a commercial code kind of compliance, but this is all residential code work, and so it's all pretty easy for us to do. So they're, they're, we make our own forms, do our own flat work, obviously our welding. I do a lot of this because the culture has changed. I, I've taught my whole life, and I, the, the students I had a long time ago are very different than the ones that I have now. And a lot of it is because the, the shift in the way in which we are able to enable young people to experience what we call life experience, you know? These kids are denied the opportunity to build a tree house. Well, not really. I mean, if they wanted a tree house, they could get one of these, right? Uh, it's the you know, industry-wide response to this kind of nonsense. But what you, what, what's changing is, there's a sort of lack of realism to that, as we know, right? And, and this is gone, you know? It's, and I'm not talking about horses and horse drawn, but there's a sort of realism. There's a smell and a texture and a fabric, and it's all real. And so what I see with young people today is that it's all very different. Nobody really knows how to do much of anything, uh, and I mean in terms of building. And I don't do this to make you builders, by any means. But I think you're going to become better architects because you've had your hands in the concrete, quite frankly. And, and the students that I have, I mean, the learning curve is just literally straight up. They're absolutely amazed by the experience. And so I'm, I'm a big advocate, as you might be able to tell, from doing, you know, offering these kinds of experiences. So this is our second house. I did a couple of little projects, uh, and I realized, you can imagine, I'm pretty tightly wound with the business and what I do with students. I went to the city of Lawrence and I said, you know, we've got some eager builders and you have an affordable housing program. Why don't we get together? And they said, oh, yeah, all right. And so we did the first couple of houses for the city. 
Uh, this, this is the second one. On the first one, they thought we had tricked them. And so they, and this one, they were guarded. And they said, well, you know, what color will it be? And we said, uh, yellow. And they said, oh, good, you know, because of course they imagined a kind of creamy Victorian and instead got a kind of DeWalt yellow. So after that, we, we quit working with the city uh, and went to another organization called Tenants to Homeowners. You might tell by the name, Tenants to Homeowners. It kind of makes uh, the disadvantaged community, um, uh, it gives them access to home buying op opportunities. We also formed a not-for-profit corporation and I struck my agreement with the university, which is literally no, we, the, the university and my agreement says, you know, we know you're doing something different and it's outside of the norm and basically that's all, we don't want to know anymore. And so, and the, the uh, at first my feelings were hurt and I thought, oh, gee, you know, because you come back, you'd build two houses already, you feel like you're a hero. And in fact, the university really didn't want to quite know about it. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And so we've been going gangbusters ever since. I don't have to ask anybody for anything. So this would have been our third house. And by now I realize I can do this in the one semester that I've described. So now I can begin to address things that I wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. So Julie, who eventually got the house, saw it as a gift from God. She couldn't believe it. She, with a debilitating disease, will eventually be in a wheelchair. So this was all about accessibility. So wheel-in showers, recycled tire rubber, all detailed for that, and then stainless steel and polygal, as you might recognize. This is our fourth house, and this is all about sustainability and recycling materials. Now, this is, it's not the year 2000 yet. I think this is 99, maybe it was 2000 when we did this, so this is now 12 years old. So we're recycling materials. You don't like your siding, you tear it off. This is Corten steel, and that's recycled aluminum. You take it to the scrapyard. You know, you don't burn it. This is uh, clear all heart red with the screens, and you'll see there's an, another one on the other side, uh, that we integrate in, and we took a cooling tower down. Down it was a Coffeyville, Kansas, which is quite a distance away. Clear all heart redwood, which is kind of a thing of the past. It doesn't rot. And then somebody called by now, we get a little reputation, and said, would you be interested, you know, we get this basketball for us? Yeah, you know, and so we were there, we got three basketball floors, and you're gonna see a lot of basketball flooring. But you know, we put it down, free throw lines and all, in the building. So that worked out pretty well. But what happened was in Lawrence, Kansas, we kind of run out of, of, of infill property. I didn't want to work out in a subdivision. And so we thought, well, let's see what Kansas City uh, has to offer. And so we went to Kansas City and uh, we said, you know, again, same deal, you know, eager builders, you know, what do you got for us? I said, be careful because what you're going to get may look a little bit different, but, you know, we have a design agenda. And they said, well, okay, you know, so they try this out. So. Uh, this is the map. We went to the Community Development Corporations, which is a glorified name for neighborhood associations. And so these, this map, we've all heard of Detroit as being sort of the emblem for what happens when we get flight to suburbia. Uh, in this case, these are vacated properties in Kansas City, Kansas. Each dot represents five vacant parcels. Now, not vacant of house, vacant of basically tax or house. In other words, they haven't paid their taxes. So the whole, the whole downtown has just been decimated. And so we go in there and we, this is our first house. And this little house won Home of the Year Award for Architecture Magazine 2004. You know, uh, the problem I was having was how do I get back and forth, right? Because I know that students, and, and incidentally, we have nothing from the university. We are literally all in material in our, on our Hondas, you know? Um, and so I, I didn't want students because the Ken City uh, sites were maybe 45 minutes away from us. Uh, we needed to have a place where we could prefabricate some things. So we, we kind of pirated a warehouse space uh, and we started doing prefab. And so here you might be able to tell where these lines are. They're going to result in this, right? So we build the whole building in the, in the factory, so to speak, push it out and load it out. And what we do here, this is 70 ton crane, and then we have a bunch of flatbeds we're going to put all of these units on. We do what you see there in about six hours. I mean, we move through this work because they don't give us this, right? And it's all about money. One of the, the interesting sidebars on this, com on why I do this is, in my business, in the two hats I wear, as soon as I hang up the phone from a prospective client, my associates will say, what's the budget, you know? I mean, that's like really important, right? Um, and the single greatest thing that is never ever talked about in studio 
is budget, right? And so something's wrong somewhere, right? So we it's part of this experience is understanding you just don't do whatever the hell you want, you know? I mean, you have choices that are made and driven by the budget that you have available. And so here we are, hauling these into Kansas City, and that was the first house. The nice thing about this is it's sold. What I'm doing now is I'm working in the inner city area, and there's a lot of derelict housing, and what we're finding is that we're able to bring these houses in and sell them right away. And that was an indication, at least indication enough for that first one, we sold for 140000 to go and try another one. We thought, well, maybe we got lucky on that one. So the next year, we did another one and, and brought it into a different neighborhood. And same idea, prefab, it's a little bit different, recycling materials. For those of you familiar with Stephen Hall's HR, uh, the block addition to uh, the Nelson, this is, this is glass, channel glass that was uh, rejected by the firm with the right color or something like that, but worked for us. And so this house sold right away as well. And you see I was getting a lot of mileage out of that basketball floor yet. <laughs> and now we're going back into crappier neighborhoods. And we just keep working our way back in. And here's the third house that we did, and it too sold right away. The second one I just shared with you, it sold right away. And now it's going by word of mouth. And so this is the third house. And I walked across, when we brought this building in, I was standing on the front with an elderly Hispanic man, came around, kind of the godfather of the neighborhood, and he said, well, you know what, you know, what are you going to try to sell this house for? I didn't have the heart to tell him, I was pretty sure it was already sold. I said, well, about 155000 And he said, are you out of your mind? And he gestured to houses up and down the street that hadn't sold at 80000 and haven't been on the market for a year. So what we find, and this is our most published house, everybody really likes this, the elevated form like this. The interior, you know, and Lester here, he can believe it. He lives across the alley. He mowed his lawn for the first time in 20 years when we had our open house just because he was so happy to have anybody interested in their neighborhood. He couldn't believe it. And so, uh, so that was great. And Kenny and Leah, who bought the house, you know, the fact that they are the only English-speaking people in a, in a 20 square block area is okay. That's cool. They're happy with that, you know? Everybody wants, in this, in this young culture now, they don't want to live in suburbia, right? They've dismissed that. They want to live in the urban area. They don't want to buy a fixer-upper because it could be expensive and nobody wants to live in that kind of thing. But they, and they all read Dwell Magazine, so they all want something that's kind of modern. And so we've tapped into that and have had a great success, so much so that we have builders doing knockoffs. These aren't our projects now. These are done by builders that our clients who eventually bought our houses, they walk by their goofy houses with the sort of faux craftsman nonsense and the you know the, the fake you know the, the wallpaper made of stone, you know, that kind of stuff. They walk right by theirs and wanted to buy our houses instead. So now the builders are doing knockoffs on our projects. Not everything goes the way we want. You know, we were turned down here in a pretty waspy Republican neighborhood. They weren't gonna have any of any of our presence there. You know, it, it's pretty tough. Uh, we may have the same here, but you know, being different and, and, and you know, pushing design and the edges of design is like attacking motherhood and apple pie, you know? I mean, they just, you know, people are very quick to dismiss something that they're not familiar with, and so that we run into a lot. So this is our fourth project. This is on a brownfield site, just basically a dump, and this house we sold for 200000 and so by now, what I'm finding is that I've got to really work the appraised value. I run this like a business. I don't get any seed money. I have nothing to do with the university. So this is a business. And I've got to try to get more for these houses because we're getting burned on the appraisals. So what we did was we needed to get a three-bedroom house. But we also know that Kenny and Leah, right, the young urban hipsters, they don't want to buy a house that's like three-bedroom. That's kind of regular. So what we do is these closets move and so when I take the urban hipsters around it's all open with a core of space but when I take the appraiser around we move the, the closets so that I get <laughs> three bedrooms and I think it's this one so one bedroom two bedrooms three bedrooms and the appraiser yeah you know that's great and so the appraisal is as high as we want and when the urban hipsters come around we move everything around so they get this kind of sense of loft living you know and so it's great it worked out very well so 
It was a tornado that hit Greensburg, Kansas, and just about wiped it out. Uh, 11 people were killed, and this was in 2007. And they talked about us going down there and maybe doing a project. It's about five hours away from us. We're in the eastern part of the state. And so we said, yeah, OK, well, we'll have a look at it. And so we went down. This is the Google map. This is before the tornado. This is after the tornado. It's amazing that so few people were killed. This is me in the helicopter. Dodge City is 35 miles an hour, uh, excuse me, 35 miles to the west, and to my left is uh, Pratt, Kansas. It's 30 miles. There's nothing in between. Tornado came right up through the center of town. So we went down and made a present presentation. They had some temporary quarters there, and you know these guys, they don't want to know what to make of us. You know, I mean, they, they had already decided that anything that the city sponsors is going to be done to a lead platinum standard. We weren't going to get city financing, but we were interested in being able to pursue a lead platinum standard. So, you know, we made a presentation. Look at these guys. They're like, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do with these? You know, they, because they knew they had to do something. And so they said, well, it looks kind of arty, doesn't it? You know, and, and they're like, yeah, you know, arty. And well, we, we need an art center. And, you know, this is the town. And, and I'm like, we need an art center. It's like, I like art, you know, but. Um, about a firehouse, you know, or a community center. <laughs> and so freaked out by the way the buildings look, they didn't, you know, they didn't quite know how to describe it. So we said, all right, you know, but I, I, I always describe this as a community center with art on the walls, as you will see. And so they put together a little not-for-profit corporation to kind of work with us. Again, no city finance. We had to get all the money to make this work. In fact, we had to stitch together four sites, contiguous sites. One guy, owner, uh, owner was in jail in Junction City. They had to go and get him to sign the deed over. So this is groundwork. I mean, we are pushing hard to make this thing work. We're trying to fit in a master plan that was done in order to obviously show respect for it. So this is the end building. Now, before we then, and part of the lead interest that we have, and this is our first lead, we are working on our sixth lead platinum building. Uh, we have four that are, no, we have three that are finalized, two that are pending, and we're working on our sixth. So, um, we went to Sunflower Ammunition, largest ammunition producer in the world, 10,000 acre site, now going back into the public realm, no longer owned by the federal government. And we said, you know, You've got some buildings in there. We'd like to recycle this material. This is all, we're working through attorneys in in New Orleans right now to try to get this material. These are magazine buildings. That's where they kept the ammunition, not bullets, but these are loads that are packed into howitzers on Navy ships. Right? This is big production, Army stuff, uh, Navy stuff, and so the buildings you can bet they kept the roof tight, and so all the wood is first first growth lumber. Most of it was was brought out in the 50s and 60s. Beautiful material, Douglas fir and pine. So we went in, took the buildings down, and basically brought it back to our warehouse. We're now an abandoned warehouse of farmland industries. No heat, no water, no toilets, nothing. Uh, but that's our location. And here we are doing prefab on that project that we'll take down to Greensburg. So same drill that I showed you earlier. And we load out a St. Patrick's Day um, 2008 and head down to uh, Greensburg. Pouring rain, unload that night. That's eight and a half hours by truck because uh, you can't go the way you would drive because you got to take the routes. It's a disaster site and you're aware of it as soon as you get there into town. You know, this is the hospital. You know, it's like right out of MASH. And, uh, and, and we're the only ones there in the middle of town that, that just started rebuilding a couple of houses. But it was really important for those people to see these young students out there working, you know, till midnight and showing up meeting me at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, this was filmed by the Discovery uh, Channel for a, a program called Greensburg. And you may, have, you may think that was fun, but that I did not get along with those people at all. They wanted to build TV drama. So anything they could do to get students to fight or me to fight with people, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so 200 mile an hour wind torqued all the trees. And so all the trees had to be taken out. And I'll take these out in no time. Here we are booming it in, just like you saw before. Uh, we, we set them down, get the slings out, and then push them back into position. And then here's our project, as you can tell. They're putting the water tower back up now. Uh, that's the old, old one, that, and that's the debris. I mean, was, the town was just obliterated. You know, it's a minefield, right, because you've got tornado shelters. 
you've got septic systems, you've got a lot of stuff that's buried out there. This guy thought he knew where everything was, and this is on our job site. So, uh, you go down there, for those of you familiar with LEED, and you say fly ash, and, and they're like, What's that? You know, uh, fly ash is a component. It's a byproduct of energy production. It's a, and we use it now in concrete, basically. And so it's a 30% mix that we use. And it's a lightweight uh, system. We've got to get thermal mass in this building so we can take advantage of that south exposure and it absorbs that heat at night. Very important concept. So this is the interior of the gallery space. This is what uh, will regulate the overheating with by the shading on that, which is calculated. Right? And so, skinned in glass, I can explain that in a moment. And then, in this example, airplane hangar. So basically, we weld all this up ourselves, bring it down there, use there. Uh, it's basically a hydraulic system with a hydraulic pump on it. So we can raise this thing up on the outside. So here you can see the way this works like that. Right? And the reason to do that, and uh, there was a lot of objection because if you look at artists, what happens is you know they don't want to have the artwork get contaminated by sunlight. And so again, going back to the idea of this being a, a very important public building, it was, it was an important gesture to make. Not unlike West Texas, the elevation change between Greensburg, Kansas, and Wichita, which is you know two hours away, is about a half an inch. And so what we wanted to do was to break that. I didn't want to set the building right on the ground, so we set it on a plinth, and you'll see this here in a second. So we built another wall directly around our building. And what that does is it gives us this, which you can make out, and then that's what happens. People begin to congregate, they use the building, they screen movies on the outside in the summertime, and they have a lot of outdoor events when they can. And so that worked out really well. The, the sustainable features here, three Kestrel, they're made in South Africa, wind turbines. One looked good, the engineers amongst you would wonder, you know, why, you know, three. One looked just kind of big and lonely, two looked like a couple, three looked great. Uh, so we ended up with, uh, let's see, all right, so here we are putting these up, anchoring those. When we put the other two up, we remember to put the turbine on top first. Uh, <laughs> learning curve, as I said, is pretty much straight up from Studio 804. So, uh, and then the outside, all skinned in glass. That's the recycled material from uh, the uh, ammunition building. The sort of poetry of kind of using a former ammunition building now on an art center was a little too hard to resist. So uh, we're pretty happy to have that. And then all skinned in glass. Right? We make all these fittings. We don't, we don't buy any proprietary systems. So this is basically uh, Unistrat. I think we've got some garden hose in there. I mean, all that stuff we make up in the field. And finally made it. This is the anniversary, which was the uh, 4th of May, 2008, exactly a year later. We hadn't quite gotten all the glass back up. Of course, we're going to finish it up. But this is the open house. Uh, that we had for our event. Some happy students, as you can imagine. I think they were happy because they were leaving Greensburg. That was not a lot of fun <laughs> down there. That was rough. And here it is at night. Here it is in use, uh, as I've always imagined it to be, for events uh, on a, outside the building. And there aren't too many people that have come here and boast about having a National Retired Rodeo Clowns annual photograph taken in front of their building. And that's, that's, that's our claim to fame. So. All right, so then we come back from Greensburg. What are we going to do next? Uh, we continue on that string of lead buildings. And so this is a house that we did. This is also the first lead platinum house in the Kansas metropolitan area. And so this would be all done in, um, it's clad in Kumaru, which is a South American hardwood. An interior, um, I like that black um, floor flowing across like a, like a sea, like an, like an ocean. And, uh, and then as tight a uh, kitchen. The big breakthrough here was we got under counter refrigerators and got rid of the, the big, you know, the big elephant in the room, which is the refrigerator. Uh, there are small triumphs here in this business. So we're very happy to have that. And this is, um, this is the only spatial divide in the entire building is this glass tower. 
And the purpose of that is to help organize the space. So back of this, is, back of that's the garage and so on. Here is what you just saw in daylight. And up here separates two rooms from uh, the, you know, basically the bedrooms from one another. The idea of a barn that you see all the way through and using the underside of the building for a one-car garage and leaving this much more space open for be it planting trees and growing flowers or a garden, etc., was important. We also are using uh, uh, concrete that uh, takes water all of a sudden I'm blank on it, permeable uh, concrete on this. Uh, we're also the first in the region to be using that. Uh, PVs, this building is completely off uh, the grid, so we have net metering as well, which means the excess that we produce, we get credit for, and we draw that off at night. Uh, you know, it's like money in the bank, and so that's great. So we have all the PVs on this, and a wind turbine, vertical wind turbine, which really doesn't do a whole lot, but it, it says a lot about what the building is and what the purpose of the building is. I have a big open house. I was talking with Michael earlier about the fact that, you know, as architects, I think we really do a bad job of explaining why our buildings look different. And I make a tremendous effort uh, to, to have flyers available, to have an open house like this. So people, you know, human nature is to dismiss things that you're not familiar with. And so we have to do a better job of familiarizing people with, with why these buildings look the way they do. And as soon as they do, everybody's intelligent enough to say, oh yeah, yeah, I get it, I understand. So that's a big part of it. So here are these graduates here. All right. I don't make any gender distinctions except for one, women who cry easily work with the building inspection department. So this is a uh, <laughs> situation here. This poor girl, she's about to come down in tears here uh, because we are pushing through every aspect of the project. And so, but otherwise, everybody does everything. So, uh, so here we are now. Uh, we've done that lead platinum, and then this is going to be lead platinum and a certified passive house as well. And so this again, in just a kind of marginal neighborhood, these old neighborhoods nobody wants to live in anymore. And so we're selling these things to these young professionals. And so this is a certified passive house. This has uh, toasted wood for the siding, You're kind of interesting uh, process, but we, we torch this wood. It's an old Japanese tradition, and it gives this very, very unique uh, look to the building. So you should know from what I've talked about, that's got to be the south side. And this is the group, this is groundbreaking. We work a lot with the neighborhood associations uh, to get them excited. Nobody speaks English, so he can't speak English except use finger motions to say how much his tortillas are. And it was great, he, he gave us lunch every day. Uh, kids looked forward to, he and his wife cooking up meals for us and then they would buy them and so on. Here we are giving tours. Uh, we happen to have a Spanish-speaking student as well who was anxious to share on an almost regular basis, monthly. We put flyers around, have people come in and see these projects. Uh, I believe in traditional materials and traditional construction techniques. So here uh, we use solder, uh, we use three-coat stucco, not a synthetic stucco. So these are, these are important parts of the way in which we, we produce these buildings. This is our warehouse now. We kind of graduated uh, the university as soon as we kind of got a lot of international publications, a lot of things around. The university said, oh, these guys aren't bad. Maybe we ought to give them a space. So this is less than half of what we have. I mean, it's more uh, twice uh, to my back in this photograph. So we have plenty of space, which is great. Here we are burning the wood for what you saw previously on the, on the earlier house. And there's the finished house. We do, in this case, we did ICFs for the foundation. They donated to the program. This is super insulated. Lead is easy in comparison to certified passive. Uh, the Germans, they have a system that if it's done correctly, they don't even bother putting air handler, uh, uh, actually dumping heat or cool, warm or cold air into the system. They take the heat off the occupants to heat the house, if you can imagine this. And uh, so we, we do dump heat, we use the Dakin um, system. Uh, mini splits and we dump that in, but I'm standing on seven inches of, con uh, excuse me, of uh, extruded polystyrene and behind me is I think eight inches in this house. It's super insulated and that's the basement. The old days where you just shoot the slab in, you know, on gravel, that's history. You don't do that anymore. Uh, so here we are getting that thermal mass again, which is really important on the upper deck. This is a big frame, and in order to get the amount of insulation that we need, we're actually using TJIs. You can imagine trying to convince the building inspection department of that. Um, uh, TJIs are, are made for roof framing, for those of you familiar with it. And so 
Here we are getting the primary structural system up. So we have 16 inches of insulation below that, which you can't see, which is in the cavity. We have four inches of ISO board on top of that. That's the passive house system, pretty intense. Here I am doing a blower door test. You can see all the construction joints are sealed. And we actually pressurize the inside of that building to make sure we have no air leakage. So the old days of blowing through framing and doing insulation, you know, in a half a day are gone. You know, you spend a lot of time caring for the way in which the building is actually built. And here's the finished building. We sold it for 155000 Exposed concrete, as you can see. And the whole idea with LEED, again, is to maximize daylight. So this is the hallway where this glass is located. So we are borrowing light from the south, illuminating the bathroom, but with a frosted glass, you know. So again, daylighting is a big thing and lead as is, or, or many other things, but at least for depicting it on this slide. So that's that finished house. So then the housing market fell apart and I couldn't sell. I sold it, but I sat on it for a year and we had no money and so we had, we now, the School of Architecture uh, has, a, has a, a, a building, it's called a Chamney Farm. There's an old dairy barn there and on the other side of this there's an old house there. And they suggested that we consider doing what's called the Center for Design Research and that's what I'm going to show you here. So here's the barn, here's the old house, this is a very busy street, the campus is a little bit beyond us. The university bought this property back when they anticipated in the 1960s that their growth could only occur in this direction. And so we're the first ones out in this region. Uh, this is also LEED Platinum, high visibility. We want to enable people to interact with this building on a regular basis for purposes of really selling sustainable concepts. So all the stuff that I've shared with you so far, you'll see here again. So we've got the wind turbine, we've got the photovoltaics, we've got the, the vegetation on the roof. This is made out of limestone tailings. So if you will, when you uh, cut stone, right, you take the slabs, the ledge out of the ground, you get it up on a truck, you haul it into the fabrication plant, usually you turn it in and you run it through the bread slicer, right, and you end up with four inch thick slabs, if you can imagine. You lay those down and you cut the pattern out that you have for your building. The, the leftover cookie dough, right, or the tailings is what it's called here, is what they're left with. They don't know what to do with it, so they put it in the dump. So you'll see more of this here as I move through it. All right? The idea in this example, at least, is to have a trom wall. And what we're trying to do is get thermal mass inside the building. So the, the, sort of the, the quality of that stone wrapping around kept very tight on the outside, continuing with glass in exactly the same plane, while the trom wall in stone steps back, right? And what we're doing is, you've all experienced leaving your car windows up in the, in the summertime, right? Oh, God, you know, it's a part of 10 degrees inside the car because you didn't leave a window open. Well, that happens, uh, car or not, can happen in the building. So basically what we do is we create this isolated space. This is called a trom wall, and that takes on heat in the wintertime, and we let that give off that heat during the course of the evening. Very, very simple yet effective way uh, to heat a space. So here we are doing our foundation work, laying and slab. This is also, this is the first certified passive commercial building in North America as well. And so here we are laying down the slab. You can see that heavy 10 mil material is what we're going to wrap the entire building in, uh, part of the, the passive process. Here we are again, thick walls, standing those walls up, framing. Uh, white TP, or, uh, uh, EPDM uh, for the roof so it reflects heat and then plants on top of the roof in addition to the photovoltaics. Uh, setting the footing uh, for the wind turbine. We made our own curtain wall. Uh, I've always found curtain walls to be um, really bulky. They're made for a uniform application which is probably a two-story span, two by four extruded aluminum or two by four extruded aluminum. They're all pretty ugly. And so we seized upon the possibility of doing this and here we are in the <clears throat> warehouse. So this is basically heavy bar stock that we use, flat bar stock, half inch, and then here we are in the whole assembly uh, with it together. 
Uh, we got to we got to put an epoxy finish on that, so we sandblast that first, and then do multiple layers of epoxy. And here we are setting that curtain wall in place. You notice that that building didn't. When I showed you the introduction part of it, it didn't have any louvers. You have to be very careful with that south exposure to not leave yourself vulnerable. It sounds great in the winter, right? Sunlight shining in. In the summer, people would vaporize behind that glass if you're not careful, right? So you got to shade the windows. And we've used louvers on everything I've shown you except for this. This is electrochromic glass. And what it does is it has a little electric current that runs through it. So in the summertime, when you don't want the room to overheat, and this incidentally is controlled on a motherboard in Minneapolis. They take the GPS coordinates and they know precisely where the building is and when sunrise and sunset is. And assuming there are no other obstructions, they can open and close those windows, meaning the opacity of those windows, by that control method. And so here we are setting the windows there. Uh, you know, doing a, um, an elevated slab like this is no small task with students that have never had their hands in concrete. The, the old trick, it's very simple. This is the oldest trick in the book. Turn what you think is your greatest liability into your greatest asset. Handicapped accessibility to this building was, was a nightmare. We couldn't figure out how we're going to make that work. And it's like, oh, of course, this very graceful ramp begins to lead you up into the building. So there's the finished windows. And here's a look of fright on those poor girls at 6 o'clock in the morning with me pouring concrete in June. Uh, we managed somehow. So there's the finished building. All right? There's the tailings. All right? We hauled three semi loads. Basically, we dressed 100 tons of stone. We had three saws going constantly in our warehouse so that we could dress those stone. We've got to get them at the right thickness, and we've got to, you, you, for those of you that have done a masonry building, you know, you don't want to have a brick that comes up here that's a wafer thin brick, right? You've got to anticipate, you've got to do what's called course the building. And so working all that out beforehand so then we could fit in what our coursing was, was, was paramount. So here we are, you know, if, if, you, if you were, not productive all day on a job site, you got sent to the warehouse uh, to cut stone all night. Uh, so here's the Trom wall as well. So I showed you the other side of it. It's only two foot deep. Uh, and then on this side, this is going to be in the room and carry that stone all the way around. On the north side, getting the water off the roof, we make a big deal out of it because we collect it in a cistern and it comes back up and it waters the wa the, this wall on the inside. So here we are collecting. There's the electrochromic glass going in. The company that we worked with were interested in working with us because we would do a butt glaze insulation. I really wanted that tight skin on the outside without snap-on uh, finishes, which are about a half by two. And we wanted to eliminate that altogether. And they wanted to do a butt glaze insulation. So that's what we're doing here. And here it is, and it's, we're still experimenting with it, but give you an idea of what it looks like when it's in use. So there's the entrance steel uh, floor, 3 sixteenths steel uh, plate on the floor. Bathroom, uh, you know, epoxy floor, steel walls on the, on the bathroom walls. Uh, part of the uh, educational aspect of this, so that people can see it, is the way you would be able to show in real time the energy that's being consumed in the building. So this is literally the bar graph that shows what the wind turbine is producing. So all of those things are important, and here's part of the sort of demonstration aspect of it. This is a green wall that's on, we call the living wall on the inside. It's 34 foot long, 12 foot tall. 10,000 ferns in the, in the face of it, watered by that cistern that I've described to you. And there's the finish. So steel floor, uh, that um, uh, credenza that you saw in, in the beginning and in this cabinetry is uh, Valcucine, is an Italian line, and they were willing to work with us a little bit as well. So uh, we have the first electric car charging station in the region, and that was part of this project. So there's the finish. And I'm going to show you one more if you can hang in there. I'm doing pretty good. Um, and that's the last one that we just finished. So we had a little college nearby come to us and say, hey, we like what you've done here. And we're all about sustainability, too. We'll take one of these over on our campus. So we said, yeah, that'd be good. So uh, we didn't do exactly the same thing, as you can imagine. There's the group. 
This is uh, called Galileo's Pavilion, and we just finished this three months ago, or less, two months ago. And it, just as a way of introduction, the, the college wanted us to give them a building that they could demonstrate sustainability with, but they didn't have a site. I mean, we put around the peri perimeter somewhere. So no, and they had this sculpture that was there, and it was out, uh, again, called uh, Galileo's Garden, and it was done by an artist in the late 70s, and we said, well, wait, you know, we can, we can use that. And the whole idea of Galileo and all this, which you'll see momentarily, was the, the artist was trying to capture a lot of Galileo's understanding of the universe at that time, which basically had him excommunicated from the church because of it, but he, he figured out that the sun actually moves in the sky on an angle that's predictable. And so this artist made a beautiful sculpture about it, and it's sort of like, hey, we, we're all about the sun too, you know, let's get along here and figure it out. So they said, okay, we, we can do this. So we took the sculpture out and then put it back in, and you'll see this momentarily. So here is, there are four columns, and there's a disc that's suspended. That shadow is from a disc up overhead, and this line is on at solar noon on the summer solstice, and this line, which you can't quite see all the way up, is on the winter solstice, solar noon. And you can calculate with some exactitude, as you can imagine, so June, July, August, September, October, November, December, and then back down the line. And it's really quite beautiful, and you suddenly realize, of course, you know, it's fixed. You know, that stuff moves around, it's hopefully going to stay the same. And so we were excited to be able to integrate it into the, into the building solution. So here you see the sculpture. We took it out to do the construction, and then we put it back. So two classrooms, one here, one over here, uh, forming a courtyard, and then this lounge space in the middle um, as well. And this is the finished product. So this face uh, is, as you should know, south, right? It's obviously the glass face of it. And this face is north, and that's uh, the tight aperture. This is all used chalkboard slate that we gathered from all around the Midwest. Uh, we took loads from Cleveland, Minneapolis, Des Moines, uh, and basically from demolition contractors who were knocking in these old grade schools, right? Nobody uses this stuff anymore. And so we gathered up all of this used chalkboard material, it's quarter inch thick, uh, and then we figured out a detail where we could anchor it to the buildings after doing considerable cutting. Uh, so yeah, I, think, I think you'll see this here momentarily. So anyway, it wraps that north side, and then the south side is all this glass, which also came uh, from another project. So here we are doing the formwork, framing it, and then setting the glass. The big glass came from a defunct Moshi Softy project in downtown Kansas City uh, that went south. The contractor had already bought all the glass, and we made a, a connection to obtain these large sheets of glass, which were 11 foot 5 in height and about 5 foot 6 in width. And that's more or less how we laid out the building, as you can see it here. That dedicated the way in which we would set this glass, and then the rest you know, went from there. So in this case, you know, they wanted inspired classrooms, so we brought in as much natural light as we could, knowing that we'd be able to get these fixed louvers on the outside, and we did that with frosted glass. So here we are doing the process, processing semi-loads of slate that's brought in. That's our setup where we cut. This is when we put it up, and this is when we put a finish on it. So here we are doing green walls. Every one of the classrooms and the lounge has a green wall as well in it. And it's, it's just a beautiful quality. The quality of the air is noticeable, and the, the kind of textures should be apparent. So it's really quite nice. Uh, cistern, 1700 gallon cistern, we got all the water off the roof, uh, hold it in a tank, and then we pull that in to water those green walls. And now we're able to use it on flush valve toilets as well. We're waiting for health departments to begin to check up, you know, get caught up with us. You know, I tell my students, if we don't, who does? You know, I, I don't think the, the argument is still going on that something's going on. The polar ice caps are melting. You know, roughly speaking, 50% of what's going on out there is contributed by buildings, right? Something's happening in the atmosphere. So what if we actually made an effort to demonstrate to the public ways that we can begin to address this problem that, by and large, we've caused? So we've got to be smart about our buildings. And so all this stuff 
on the interior of the building that I'm sharing with you here is available for them to look at. So there are big displays that talk about the, the uh, MEPs and all the systems. We made our own glass louver system for shading out of extruded aluminum. Whoops. And here's the finished louver. So these are um, uh, you know, detached from the face, but calculated shading so that we don't overheat. And then we made our own light fixtures here. It's all LEDs, that's all anybody uses today, uh, environment-wise. And, and you, we can get a tube that we put those in, it's a fiber, basically. And, you, and roughly speaking, one LED will charge about 30 of these fibers. And we took steel plate, and we drilled a pattern in the steel plate, pushed the fiber through, the LED is hidden up above it, and that's what you get in the end. You get that beautiful sensation of that lighting floating like that, and at night, it's really powerful. So here you can see what that looks like. And there's the night shot of the building. I'm done. I made it all the way through. So, thank you. If we can hold off for a race in the happy hour, I'd be pleased to answer any questions if you have any. So. Uh huh. A lot of your projects seem to reuse a lot of materials. You mm -hmm. go out and you find materials from projects that failed or didn't get off mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Just yep. Years, like the last yep. project. Right. How much lead time does that take? Because it looks like you're starting a project yeah, yeah. and you're moving yeah. forward pretty quickly. Yeah. Do you buy the materials ahead of time as you? find them and then use them? Or Sometimes it's rare. Usually we sort of know where these things are, and, um, but we got to move pretty quickly on them. Uh, so the slate, we uh, had a pretty good idea that we could work out the details on it. Um, and it's just the whole idea, you know, a, you know, a college campus with chalkboard, you know, and learning and people that stood at that board for so many years. Again, that sort of poetry is pretty exciting. And so we threw, a, you know, again, you know, I actually, I don't even make a phone call. That's one of my rules. Students do everything. And only on rare occasions I intervene. Um, but so Phil, you know, just started networking. We said, okay, man, let's, let's work this out. You know, and I, I mean, I, there's a lot of coaching that goes on. They meet me seven day, six days a week uh, when we're under full sale like that. So it's sort of knowing where some things are and being able to get after it, you know. Uh, good question. Uh huh. Uh, thank you. Are all these buildings done with student help? Throughout. With the exception of the last two, what I have to do, the last two are commercial. So what I have to do in order to get permitting lined up is we, first of all, we have to have consultants on this. This has the, the uh, heating and air conditioning system, as an example, is like a Ferrari in this thing. And this is a very sophisticated. We use two energy recovery ventilators per building. There's really three buildings here, just as a for instance. And it's all pretty high tech stuff. We do all the design work. We do all the layout, we figure everything out. We make up all the duct work, and that these are people that I've worked with for years that will become the subcontractor. Only, I won't charge the system, that we're not gonna do that. Well, we'll, we'll hang the fan coil units. You know, we'll, we have a pretty good idea of what we can and can't do. And I also know when to call in the infantry, and that's when the, the subs come in, usually because the timing is gonna become a problem for me. So in that example, when we, do, we run all the Romex, if the kid that I'm working with in, in, the, uh, in the residential work is comfortable making up the panel and I can watch him do that and he can show me that he knows how to do it, we'll make up the panel. That's only happened twice, I think. Uh, if I don't do that, I'll have the electricians come in and they'll just make up the panel and leave. Uh, likewise with the plumbing. We have, I, I never make gender distinctions, but we do have girls on our site. And so people love to work on our job sites. Uh, it's just the nature of the business. You know, it's a work-a-day world out there for most people. And a chance to have young people and a, a, you know, both genders, that's exciting. You know, and they want to work with us and they come out, they don't do it for free. But we work that out. Now, I have, because on the one, the first one I showed you, the Center for Design Research, I had to bring my employees in later because I got to mop up after everybody. Everybody graduates the third weekend of May. If we don't make that deadline, which we didn't in that, because just because of the enormity of the project, then what? So I bring my people in and myself, and we finish the project out. I have a couple of straggler students, um, but I learned a hard lesson. So now I'm going to maybe bring a couple of my people in a little bit earlier if I need to. So it, it depends, and my, my people don't understand that it's the student's project. I don't want us doing a lot of work if we can avoid it. 
So anyway, it's a bit of a juggling act. But uh, the other stuff I've shown you, yeah, we do everything. So students have a variety of classes? No, 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 they don't take any other classes. Oh, no, no, no. You, you're not going to take other classes. You're not going to take your tool belt off and go take calculus. You know, you, you can't do that. No, no, no. I, I have it set up so nobody takes any other classes. They might have a nighttime class that I don't know about. <laughs> but otherwise, no. No, you can't, you can't build these kind of buildings in that time frame. Uh-huh. Yeah. How many credit hours do they get for a semester? Uh, you get six for studio, three for a practicum, so you're guaranteed nine. If you need another three, you can take a special problems with me if you'd like to. And I hardly make it. You know, I don't say, oh, all you guys go home and the three, you know, the other, you know, come with me. It's, I, I could care less. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. With the exception of about six hours of sleep every night, it's full, it's full time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, they, I, they literally meet me at 6.30 in the morning. And they better be ready to work because they, it takes about a week or two to figure out that you're not going to do it on two or three hours of sleep. And so once we get that established and we, and we make it clear that you're going to come and you're going to work, just showing up, you know, you think that's a lot, you know, and your mother's not going to do this for you. Nobody's in the background here taking care of it. You're going to build a building. And so there's a little, you know, a little meeting of the minds. Once they get into that, then we, you know, about productivity and, you know, being sure that you've accomplished something. And so it does take a lot of time. They can't do anything else. And that's one of the criticisms that I get from students, you know, oh, well, I can only go to all the basketball games, you know, and I don't know, I'd be too tired, you know, it's like, get out of here, you know? You have an opportunity of a lifetime, you know, and, you know, it just seems to me, you know, that sort of passion for, you know, at least what I'm doing, but it applies to a lot of other things. It's sort of vacant, you know, it's just like, you should go to class, you know, it's just, it's stupid, you know, the way we teach is absurd, you know, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we usually spend, uh -huh, we usually spend about three to four weeks on design and, and I'm, I'm not going to do anything that I have to apologize for. And so it becomes a bit of a shell game. Uh, they, I might see something that I really like, but I will never ever let anyone know. We are all doing it together and in no way will I ever identify any person who might be called the architect, right? I avoid that like the plague. We are all doing it together. And I can trick them, I can be incredibly persuasive, and usually after about three or four weeks of meeting me every morning except Sunday, you know, to go through, you know, design again, uh, I don't care, you know, I just came because I thought we would be building something, you know, I'll do anything, you know, they're so sick of it, you know, and it's, and it's like, then you begin to kind of shape it, you know, and so it, it, it does take time, and it does also take living up to a standard. You know, I mean, there's a very, at least I like to think that there's a standard of design quality that we aspire to that it, it, it takes hard work to do good work. And one of the things I find with, with the computers, and I was trying to joke with people today about this, is, you know, you, as soon as you go to architecture school and you get your first, you know, sketch up or whatever goofy stuff you're using, hey, God, you look like you're a genius, you know, you show your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your mom and dad, oh, you were awesome, you know, and it's like, that's so, that's so hollow, it's so shallow, there's nothing there, you know, and I know that and you know that because I'm going to point it out to you very quickly. And so getting people to bear down and understand how to work and get through a lot of this stuff is part of the art of doing this and to keep them from killing one another, you know? Because we're very cannibalistic and we want to kind of turn on everybody. And I can teach anybody how to weld, but these, these very delicate egos are very, very, you know, hard to work with. But to keep everybody on board and part of the project is part of the art of doing it. It's a great, great question. Somebody else? John? Dan, uh, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You're uh, the question is, if you start January 3rd and you have three to four weeks of design and you're building yeah. through May, when does working drawing start? And, yeah. and what this this changed, and thank you for asking, it changed with this, the last two projects. What we did was then when I start, I have them in the fall, as I do now, and they will go with me through the build phase. I would, if I can get them out of the ground in, in uh, December, I will. 
But what we do is, you know, you do the traditional, you know, studio. I mean, you're doing research, you're kind of figuring out the projects, working on budgets, getting things aligned, getting everything sorted out, getting approvals from clients, and then doing construction documents, getting permits, all that stuff is now mostly happening in the uh, uh, fall semester. And then if I can get it, all that stuff in a row and, and get out of the ground in December, I will, or November. Uh, in this case, we broke ground on the 4th of January on this project. And then we had an open house on the summer solstice, June 20th, leap year. Uh-huh. Yes, then uh, explain us the, the financial thing. So you're selling your first project and the money goes into the dean's pocket, or what happened? No, 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 I have absolutely, <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to do with the school. Uh, the, uh, when I went to the city and I went to the CDCs and so on, remember that when I was showing you that? I run it like a business, and so what I do, um, the easiest way to describe it is I'll go to a CDC, they're in the business of basically infusing new life into their neighborhoods. They have access to funds, most of it through neighbor works, a lot of federal programs are out there. I say to them, you loan me $100,000 or $200,000 for what will probably be no more than a four month period. I'll give you 8% on that. I need to have it in the following draws, and I need it when I ask for it. They're like, okay, yeah, that's not bad. You know, it's not going to cost us anything. We're going to get more than we would while it sits in a bank. Why not? So, and in the end, they're going to get a house to boast of in the neighborhood. And so we get the money. I take that as I need it to build a building. We sell the house. I pay them back plus the 8% but I've sold the house at whatever the market will bear. So if I can sell the house with enough profit, so to speak, to cover not only the costs, but to put back into the business, I'm ahead. And that's actually how I did. The last two houses, when we came back from Greensburg, I didn't have anything with the CDC. We had the money in the bank to do those projects. And I lost a little bit because we couldn't sell them right away, but I did lease them. So, you know, it's now we're working more as a developer. But initially, when we started, we just worked with the city and I made the draws from them. But 804 is a, is a not for profit. Yes. Buy all these things, I'm just uh, to understand. Oh, yeah. That's a non taxable. Um, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. A not for profit corporation is pretty common. 501c3. You know, you can, you can become a not for profit like, online, like I did. You know. <laughs> Go to legal, legalzoom.com. It's easy. <laughs> I don't want to give away any trade secrets, but you know, it's pretty easy. Uh, so, good question, so seriously. Anybody else? Uh-huh. Uh, yep. Uh, They're like you. They're the same. Nobody's different. You know. <laughs> seriously. Yeah. I mean, basically, we have kids who... You know, they, they get an MR degree, but basically they're right out of high school, but they are about to graduate. So they are in their fifth or sixth year. I have a lot of students that come in that transfer. They may have a four-year degree, they may have a, a BARC from some other school, and they'll graduate with an MARC, and, and they'll fit in the program somehow. I don't care about that kind of stuff. That's housekeeping and other people. You know, we're in the business of education, so you can bet we'll make something work. And so, but no, no people with a lot of experience by any means. In fact, uh, this year, not this project, but this year's project, I believe I have 11 women, nine guys. So we're, we have more women than guys, which is fine, which is great. Uh, in fact, the women are great because they ask. They don't try to hide, you know, they're quick to say, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to do that. Um, and so it works out much better. The guys are a little more macho, they gotta pretend like they know. <laughs> anyway, good question. Anybody else? Yeah, does the student get any financial assistance in this process? Not at all. Not at all. I, if, if, if they start to think that they deserve, you know, first of all, they're absolutely worthless. They're a lot of <laughs> You gotta be kidding me. I don't know what your students are like, but these, these kids are worthless. I mean, they, you just watch them run a screw in, it's painful. I mean, they can't do anything. And uh, maybe one or two exceptions. But, you know, I mean, there are schools out there that teach you how to build, and you pay a tuition to do it, you know? You're getting this experience from us, really, at a regular university, you know, tr uh, tuition. Uh, so I, I don't, I have absolutely no, 
soft spot for paying them back. I help them out if I can. This project was an hour away. I helped them out with gas money. You know, that, that seemed reasonable to me. But anything more than that is it ain't gonna happen. So, good question. Anybody else? Uh-huh. When you're building, do you ever come across building inspectors having these guys do anything, like the car, the boat, quality control, and- Sure, I understand. Sure, sure. Well, you gotta realize I've been doing this my whole life, so I know where the quicksand is. The sheetrock you see us in the, see in the finished house is very likely not the sheetrock we started with. Um, finishing sheetrock, I mean, I just know where all the problems are. Knocking off concrete, I'll do the concrete with them. And, you know, we poured concrete on the foundation. You saw the snow, right? You take your time on that. By June, I was knocking kids out of my way because the concrete is going so fast, no matter how much water you put in it, it's getting away from you. And they're clueless. They don't have any idea. I'm saying, hurry up, hurry up. And pretty soon I'm grabbing edging tools out of their hands because they're just not moving through it. And so, and that gets, you know, those kinds of lessons get learned pretty quickly. Things that get torn out, yeah, we never, I mean, I know the code and I know what we're up against. And so uh, we may make alterations sometimes, you know, like we had to swap out some receptacles this year because we tried to sneak through. I knew they weren't going to make it, but we tried to sneak by the inspection department to use basically a residential fixture that would have a different kind of cover on it. Not, not worth explaining. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of stuff that gets done many times. So, good lessons, good questions. Ben. Um, industry, I, I, I have to go to a broader fashion. I have a I notice that you, you list a lot of the people who are the suppliers and manufacturers and distributors. Do they donate some of this material? Do they do it depends. Them? We're not beyond asking. Uh, right. You can bet that. Um, Usually, what the biggest trouble, the big problem that I run into, and I shared this with Michael earlier, is. You know, you go through these people, you, you meet these people, and everything out there, the way the industry is set up is sort of retail pricing, right? And then there's the next tier, which is basically buy and wholesale. And that's what contractors do. And that's, I'm, I'm a contractor. I mean, so, and not through just Studio 804, but Rockland Associates doing all of our building. I know how the things are tiered. And so when we go to um, Kohler Faucets as students, this is before they came to know us, um, they, they would say, well, you know, we can work with you, and they make a big deal out of uh, what a great job, they, you know, what a hell of a deal we're going to get, and the students happy when they hang up, and the pricing is really what I buy it at, you know, they're not doing them a big favor, and so I try to get well below that. I can always go in and buy stuff, and I very often do on my accounts, just because it's easier and it's faster and I know I get it wholesale. But we work very hard to get as large a donation as we can possibly get from just about anything. It just depends, and everything is negotiable. Again, the students do it all, though. I don't, I don't do any of that. So we'll go to Greenville this year, and we'll hit Greenville like a SWAT team. We know all the exhibitors. We know what we're after. They have a scripted text, and they are going to descend upon them. They'll have business cards. They'll have a cover letter. And if they get a nibble, that's what we call it, then they come back with the book that you have. Say, that's what we do. You can be part of this, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, this building is valued at $2.1 million. We did it for what I hope to be $800,000. I'm kind of a, having a problem with this college. But roughly $800,000. That difference is in labor. That difference is donated materials. And we work very hard to try to get as much as we can possibly get from industry to work with us. Especially when you get into those high-end materials. So it's a good question. Somebody else? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Uh, well, I actually think it's better, quite frankly. Um, I've been around a lot of industry, um, and I saw some skilled men building a building of ours in Clovis, New Mexico, and there's no comparison. I mean, quite honestly, we, we do, I don't tolerate anything that is not perfect. I am very big on craftsmanship. And I can remember I went down, there's another build studio that's out in the country. 
uh, not ours. And I went down there, and the kid was folding, flashing over his knee, you know. And I, and I said, man, yeah, there's a tool you can use for that because they're making a curve flashing, you know. And he looked at me and said, hey, who are you? You know, we're the, we're the X studio. I said, man, you got a lot to learn about craftsmanship. And so I am very prideful of the quality of what we do. And it, I, as far as I'm concerned, it exceeds. When we did the Center for Design Research and we had the DCM, Division of Construction Management, come in for the final walkthrough, those people were, they were like, we don't get this kind of quality when we go out in the industry. So take that. <laughs> so I mean, I am really big on quality all the way. And we'll take a lot of stuff out if it's not right. So that's a great question, though, actually. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. At the end of the day, what, or what do you enjoy doing? Like, what's, the, what's the take? Well, you know, yeah, of course I stagger away from these projects because they just eat you alive in terms of your time and everything else. And it makes it very difficult to keep the business stuff going because I am there every day, at least on these last couple. When we're doing the houses, it's a little easier because I could kind of turn them loose and I would come back to them or whatever. But these are, these are pretty intense projects. I think I'm going to probably step a little bit back away from this level of intensity, um, and that's what I'm working on right now. We're doing another university building, but it's not quite as um, lavish in its in its completion, and we're trying out. But I am still experimenting with a lot of these kind of energy um, concepts. I want to do a double glass wall. I'm able now to actually identify what I'd like to do pitch it to DCM, Division of Construction Management, so oh, we have a project that might work for that, you know? I want to do a double wall out of glass, and then we pump insulation into that during the night, and we vacuum it out during the day. Uh, we're constantly battling our desire for glass, right? As architects, we love light, and the, the need for super quality, super insulated buildings. And so that's the next step. So I present that to these people and they say, yeah, we, we have a building where I think maybe we can get you in there. So that, and, and that's been working pretty well. I hope that's what we'll do. So good question. Uh -huh. What's the name of that project so we can look it up? <laughs> no, it's a proprietary system actually. <laughs> so we're going to Anyway, any other questions? Well, great. You've been terrific. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.